What's up guys, welcome back to Fisher Hex. Today I'm back here with Mike Lemming. Got some uh, new headphones here so I can actually hear people when they talk to me. Uh, anyways, we're gonna talk about uh, fish and cleanup crew today. We're gonna do some beginner uh, questions that Mike has regarding his system. And uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. What's up, Mike? What's up, guys? Um, first off, I wanted to compliment you on those uh, cute headphones you got on. They look, uh, well. they, they look really nice. Um, so... Dickhead. Just to throw this out there, I appreciate you guys watching. I don't have the, that, that many views on my Q&A videos, but I know Travis has a ton. Um, I've gained you know, more subscribers, so I appreciate you guys watching. It's nice to get feedback that people are actually saying, keep them coming. Um, so me being a new guy to the hobby and Travis being used to all these views, it's, it's just nice to see somebody appreciates it. Um, but let's just dive right in. I, I've made up some questions today at work. Um, so let's get into it. So my first question, and guys, this is a fish and cleanup crew topic. Um, there's a lot of questions that people have, so I'm just going to dive in. Um, first off, this is one thing that a lot of guys jump into the hobby kind of overdo. Uh, but my question is like, what's your thoughts on like the inch per gallon or, you know, like how many fish can you have in a tank? Basically well, everybody think, says one yeah. inch per gallon. I don't really find that true, but you know more than I do. Yeah, I mean, the inch per, inch like per gallon is a pretty safe rule to go by, but uh, it will depend on what your uh, your maintenance schedule is or what you have for a skimmer or what your how much rock you have in the tank. Yeah, the biological filtration will all dictate how many fish you have. Uh, I mean, ideally, uh, even something with a bio pellet reactor, you can uh, have more fish because you're able to pull out that and with a refugium, you pull out those excess nutrients. But uh, I think an inch by inch per gallon is definitely a safe way to go for people who are just starting out. Uh, once you get more advanced, I mean, you can have uh, several more fish. Uh, it's just also uh, how the fish get along with each other. You're going to have to do, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, um, personality dependent and uh, how the fish re react to each other. Yeah, because I've heard people yeah. say that that inch per gallon rule is BS. Mm -hmm. It's all about what you're filtrating your, your mm -hmm. tank with, what filtration you have, what skimmer you have. Um, and this even brings it back to fresh water. You know, I just had a hang on the back and people are telling me, you know, they say I have a 10 gallon and so 10 inches of fish. I had, you know, just a little school of tetras and that was damn near 10 inches and it was only like six of them. So, yeah. um, I've heard that it's all about their filtration. So mm -hmm. I, I'm true. sure yeah. the more experienced reefer and, you know, freshwater guy can probably get away with more. Um, but you know, a lot of people will probably still have questions about that. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is about buying fish. Do you think, like, you know, you go to the local fish store, you're looking for a new fish. Uh, they have a group of clowns. Are you looking for the, the most juvenile, the most small? Are you looking for something mid size? Are you looking for, like, a full-grown? Like, when you go, what are you looking for as far as size? Um, well, when it, well, as, of, as for size, obviously, uh, the bigger the fish is, the more mature it is. Ideally, the uh, longer it's been alive, it's built up on immune immunities to several things. So uh, bigger fish usually do well. Um, compared to <laughs> compared to smaller fish, uh, when it comes to like something like a clownfish, something like that, I will pick the adult over the smaller one. Really? Uh, just because uh, I'll, you know, same with actually, especially uh, I'll, I'll mention this in my hippo tang video, but uh, smaller fish such as the hippo tang, really the mortality rate is really really high, and that's one of the reasons why I went ahead and bought a five and a half inch hippo tang from the beginning uh, and proved my chances of survival. So uh, ideally, the bigger fish is more what I'm looking for. So. Yeah, because I've because I've heard you know you know how the internet is. People say one thing, somebody else says the other thing, and then a third person comes in and throws a curveball and then says something different. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say bigger stuff like what you're saying is because they kind of they've been in captivity for a little while. Like most of the bigger fish have probably been in a fish tank for a few months uh, to grow that way. But I've also heard to get small stuff because they'll grow to your tank. They will get to know you. You'll you'll. It's kind of like a puppy. You buy a puppy. Mm -hmm. You buy it small. Um, and then you can basically raise it how you want. It gets acquainted to you and it just, you know, like I've seen people get little like inch sized blue tangs and now they can like hand feed it. I think you can feed hand feed a couple of your fish. So again, that's another question that I had personally that I'm sure other people have. Well, I don't really know the memory of what a fish has and related to it growing up with you being there. Um, I mean, I really, I'm not a scientist. So I don't really know what the short term memory of a, of a hippo tang is, but, um, most fish that you buy, 90% of them, I'd say, roughly are wild caught. So they've never been in the tank. Really? Yeah, I mean, every hippo tang that you see out there is wild it, it caught. It is, yeah. Um, so, and that's a lot, that's, it is with a lot of species because we haven't really developed ways to breed them. I um, think that's a goal of mine. 
I might be yeah. the first guy to breed a hippo tank. Hippo tank, yeah, yeah, you yeah. and everybody else. Um, um, yeah. So on to the next one, um, and this is, could be a stupid question because I, I'm pretty sure I know how you feel about this, but not everybody knows. Um, quarantining, quarantine mm-hmm. everything, whether it's from your friend's tank, from the LFS, from Petco, from online, you quarantine every single fish mm-hmm. you get, right? Yep, every fish. Cleanup crew, I don't quarantine. Um but when I do add cleanup crew, I do it uh, uh, smaller amounts at a time, just in case they come with you know something. I make sure the shells are clean, all that stuff. But yeah. as for fish, uh, everything gets quarantined. Um, and go ahead. What's your life cycle for quarantine? Because I know you do it for quite four a, weeks. What, it, it's four, four weeks. weeks, and then if I get uh, say two weeks in, something gets uh, like ick or something like that, or shows signs of, of illness, I will start the quarantine period over at the point. If I get ick, I usually drop it down to hypo for six weeks. And then back up for four weeks. So that's a long process. And when you um, say hypo, you mean lower the salinity. Hypo salinity, yeah, one point zero zero nine. So, yeah. so another thing is, like, when you put them into quarantine, you're not doing anything different. You're just feeding mm-hmm. them and watching them, right? You're not yep. dosing nothing. All right, because that's yeah. uh, you know that's something I want to do. I mean, I'm trying to with this new setup. I want to have a quarantine under my tank. Like, I mm-hmm. I want to have my sump here and a small quarantine right here. Just for the sake of the wifey not yelling at me for having mm-hmm. another tank up and running. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so that's another thing that you put on your video recently, uh, the video last night or whatever is the 30 things. Um, quarantining and patience. Like mm-hmm. that's one thing I don't have. So um, I'm going to have to learn to be patient because, because you know, when you get like a 30 gallon like mine, it was it's still tough. I can't get out the six line rafts. Uh, but when I put a 75 in there, or you get the 75 going, and I have you know 70 pounds of rock, I can't get anything out. So you know that's that's a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. quarantine to make sure everything's healthy and make sure it's eating. That's uh, that's that's really good. I need to learn to to be patient about it. Well, you need to look at the uh, the repercussions of not quarantining. I mean, right now with the amount of fish I have in my tank, uh, if I was to, I mean, the risk is too high. Uh, losing everything and then having the tank be follow for for you know six months to uh, you know a year it's just ridiculous it's not worth the risk yeah. you kind of got to you kind of have to experience and have the downfall to appreciate quarantining so here's a question so if you throw the uh, blue hippo tank we've been talking about that mm-hmm. you throw a hippo tank in your quarantine it's eating fine it's doing great um, and you see no problem say four weeks into putting it into your main tank there's still got to be some kind of percentage of stress mm-hmm. that could bring on that, you know, bring on that hippotanes ick again, just from simply taking it to quarantine into the new tank, right? Mm-hmm. Well, um, usually uh, the stress alone from shipping and stuff really brings out that the ick and uh, or you know brings out parasites that they might have gotten on the way. Uh, the thing is, is remember that that tile goby that I purchased that was in quarantine for four weeks. That was in my tank for two weeks, and then he starved himself to death. And uh, you know the cleanup crew was picking him up off the off the bottom of the tank. So yeah. uh, it, just because you go through quarantine doesn't mean that the fish is going to survive the main tank lifestyle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, he just uh, he passed. He just wouldn't eat after. I mean, he ate every single day in quarantine. Uh, and then just when he got in the main tank, it, it didn't work uh, out I that guess, way. I guess, you know, this hobby, you, you take it with a grain of salt, right? Mm, yeah. um, uh, next question. Um, and this is something that I did not do. Um, but with the 75, I will. Um, planning your order of, of fish additions. Like, you know, I'm not going to throw a yellow tang and a blue tang and then throw in some cardinal cardinal uh, or pajama cardinals or something you 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 should plan out your your fish additions right um to a certain extent um you're going to want to look at if you're going to do tangs i always recommend that you do all your tangs at one time uh and have them roughly the same size that way they can uh, kind of weed out you know the pecking order um i know that i added my blue hippo uh, after myself and but she's a little bit bigger than he is and they you know they go at it but there's really no uh, that much aggression but when it comes to like some like tangs you kind of want to add them all at one time and i know that can be difficult because tangs are expensive um but the rule of thumb is say you add uh two tangs uh when you, when you first start your system and you want to add another one like three or four months later try to buy one of roughly the same size because if they're around the same size then th- that one can at least defend himself and they can deal with it on their own yeah yeah so and then when you know things uh you know like if they're different species like clownfish and cardinals and stuff like that, uh, you know, you can add those, whatever. I mean, I wouldn't go ahead and add like 10 uh, uh, clownfish at one time because, uh, you know, the pecking order and they're going to be each other. And, you know, cardinals have to be kind of grouped together as well. So uh, 
really the tangs are the only thing that I would consider kind of having to play that uh, that game with them. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, I'm sure you've done a video on this, but you know, to watch the video, you probably got to run through 150 videos of yours to find it. Um, good for you, by the way. Okay. Um, so process of acclimation, like what are you doing? You, you get your new fish, regardless mm -hmm. of what it is, you bring it home. What do you do? Uh, well, I usually float the bag for 20 to 30 minutes just to get temperature. And then I put the, uh, the bag or I dump the con contents into like a bowl or a five gallon bucket. And then I drip that for, um, depending on the species, uh, something like a damsel or a clownfish or something that's more hardier, I will drip for maybe uh, 20 minutes or so, but something uh, like a sensitive, like a blue hippo or, um, something like that, I would drip for a longer period of time, up to the 45 minutes before adding them into a tank. So, and then once it's all done, you just net it, throw it in and hope for the best. Yep, take it out. Uh, yeah, but I also, uh, my quarantine system, I have the PVC set up in there. I don't have any lights. Uh, it's dark in that room. So uh, they get a good, once they get introduced in the quarantine system, it's dark and they have time to pretty much uh, uh, get ready, you know, be, uh, you know, change. So, that, so that's a good question. You don't have lights on your quarantine system. No, there's no need. I mean, there's So what no... do you keep that? Because it's like a walk-in walk closet, right? Yeah, yeah. So do you just keep that door open all the time or is nope. it just always it's, pitch black? It's, it's always pitch black. Uh, oh. and, you know, the Zeovit was, when it when the Zeovit was in there, that, you know, took care of itself with its own lighting. But uh, quarantine doesn't need light. Fish don't need light to be happy. But, I mean, I do go in there every day. Uh, when I get up in the morning, um, when I do have quarantine, though, I, I do like to have my lights on a little bit more during the day, even though even if I'm not in there, because the fish needs to realize that it's daylight and it needs to swim around and mm -hmm. needs to be active and eat. If it's dark all the time, the fish is going to think it's time to sleep and all that stuff, and it can really impact its health if that goes on for days and days and days and days and days. Um, but, uh, yeah, a day... And, you know, without light is not a big deal, but, uh, you know, several days will be an issue. Yeah. So, so kind of off topic, if, you know, back to what I was saying, if I do throw a quarantine, say it's a 10 gallon that's down near my sump under my tank, mm -hmm. um, I have the one bulb like floodlight. Um, so that'd be fine. Right. It's not, the, it's not directed right at the tank. Like, well, you're going to have a refugium, right? See. You're having a, ref you're having a refugium, correct? Of course. Yeah, then uh, that light from when your refugium is on is more than enough light for okay. that whole stand. So you can at least see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. You, it, generally, if there's light down there from your refugium during the off cycle, it does, that's going to be fine. You won't need to put a separate light over the – if it's in the same general area, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, one thing I've thought about, and I told you this before, like I've bought fish. They look great at the store, look great in my tank, and then my whites turned off. And then that's what really like magnifies the, uh, the ick or whatever it has. Mm -hmm. Um, I have this little tiny like clip on light. It's like a three watt. It, it's probably like 30, 30 bulbs, but combined it's only three watts. Mm -hmm. um, can I like set that on the same timer? I mean, it's like nothing light, but it, it'd just be nice to see my, my fish under blue light just to see. If I set that at the same timer with my refugium, I mean, that's all right, right? Yeah, well, I mean, ideally you're going to see ick regardless if it's white or blue. I mean, you'll pick up on little things more in the blue light. You can do that if you want, um, but ideally you have you have enough light from your refugium. If you want the blue to just kind of check out the fish, that's fine. Um, but I wouldn't have it on like an opposite schedule or refugium or anything no. like that because you just want to have that one uh, period of light. Yeah. All right, so uh, these are the first like five questions were kind of guided at or kind of aimed at me and everybody else. This is more aimed at me because I don't know what everybody else has going on for their, their tanks and their new tanks. Um, yellow tang in a four foot 75. What do you think? Um, depending on the size. Uh, if, um, and I'm getting to this in my hippo tang video as well. Uh, you know, Purchasing, you know, you got to realize that uh, the fish is going to grow. You have to, when, when purchasing a fish, you need to do the research and, and decide uh, if it's going to, your environment that you're making is going to be suitable for this fish its entire life. Now, I know that you're probably going to upgrade uh, relatively quickly after the 75. If you buy a small yellow tang, that's fine, um, but be prepared uh, to upgrade as needed because, I mean, I've had, uh, you know, massive, massive yellow tangs. And, um, and, and the reality is they need the swimming room and you need to be able to provide that environment. So, you know, you do what you want when it comes to that. But um, I wouldn't recommend anything smaller than a six foot tank for tangs in general. Um, so yellow tank, preference. blue tang. Any tank. I mean, you uh, can. Naso, naso, orange naso. shoulder. Yeah, well, nasals get really big. And, and I mean, the blue hippo big. tang gets a foot long. I mean, that's no joke, man. I mean, granted, so no it takes blue, years. No blue hippo in my 75, you're saying? I wouldn't do it. Um 
two reasons. For one, they, they had they, Dory, bro. They had, well, everybody wants fucking Dory. I'm going to get into that later. Uh, the thing is, is that you got to be prepared to upgrade. You got to be ready for that fish to grow. I mean, it's not going to grow a foot. It's not going to grow a foot overnight, but the, it's capable of doing. So you got to keep that in the back of your mind. Now you can buy a two inch uh, blue hippo or a two inch um, yellow tang. You can put them in your 75. That's fine. You can do that. But, in like a year from and, now but, is but when being, I know in my head I have to. You have to, good. you have to, you have to have the mindset that you're gonna upgrade, but you actually have to upgrade when the time comes. You can't just set up like, oh well, he's been in here its whole life already. Um, I'm just gonna leave it in there. That's not acceptable when it comes to fish keeping. And and going back to that, when you look at freshwater, it's like everybody goes to the store and buys an Oscar because it's so personable. It's like uh, your screen went black there, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's like. People go and buy an Oscar because it's so, it's like the puppy of the of the freshwater world, and uh, the reality is is that um, that fish is going to grow very quickly, and you need and a lot of people are just throwing in ten gallon because it's you know it's this big, but yeah. it gets this big in six months, you know. So I, you can get what you want for fish, and I tell people to do what they want because it's human nature; you can do whatever you want. But just be aware that you need to be able to provide the environment for that fish its entire life. Well, as you know, I mean, if I get that, the, the you know, yellow or hippo, mm -hmm. you're in the saltwater hobby as well. You have a 125 and ready to go bigger. I'm sure you're going to get a 250 and then a year from now ready to upgrade to like a 400. So. I'm actually going straight to a 400, but yeah. All right. So you cut that out. So you're going to get <laughs> yeah. a 400 then yeah. and you're, wanna get, you're going to want to turn your swimming pool into a saltwater reef. Um, so, you know, it's just how it is. You get in a hobby, yeah. you want to progress. So. I mean, knowing that I'm going to go to, like, a big tank, you know, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, a big tank is, like, what you have with the uh, 125 mm -hmm. or maybe even bigger. It'll happen eventually. It's just I kind of got to, like, acclimate my girlfriend to the idea. Um, yeah. So it'll happen eventually. So I, I, so you, I think if I were to throw in, like, a two-inch blue uh, tank in there, knowing that within a year from now I'll be at, like, a 125. So I, you think I'm good to go? Uh, yeah, you're fine. Just be aware that uh... – with that species in particular, the hippo tang, the smaller you buy it, the more chance of mortality. So be aware of that when it comes to buying yeah. the fish too. So, all right. So there goes my next like four questions about tangs. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So man. we kind of talked about this briefly. You've said it in a video, but um, you know, I told you I've had ick before my tank, mm -hmm. and what I use is Cordon's ick attack. Um, it's all natural. I've used it twice in my current tank. Um, it didn't, it didn't make any of the, any of the, um, coral sh uh, shrink up. All my invertebrates are fine and it cured, I can't say cured it, but at least they were gone from the fish. Um, everybody has their own way of doing it and yours is simply salinity, right? A hypo salinity seems to be the ideal way for me to do it. Um, a copper, uh, has worked in the past as well. Um, but like I said, you have yours already in the tank. I've really never ran across a product that I was able to cure ick efficiently in a reef tank. Now, there, this is I haven't tried it in a long, long time because I haven't had ick in my main display in a long time. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, you, ick is a very, very strong parasite, and it takes a lot to penetrate uh, its beginning stage. I can't remember the actual name of it, um, but it's basically uh, like a, a hard shell. Um, and that's the life cycle it stays in for a long time. So being, a, being able to uh, penetrate that and kill the parasite is very difficult. And I have never yet, and like I said, I've never found anything that I was able to uh, actually uh, do that efficiently. Um, so maybe it does work. Um, maybe that one that you have does work in the reef tank. Uh, but only time will tell, to be honest with you. You'll find out within you know six weeks if it actually worked or not. Yeah. Um, so far it's worked, but we will see, you know, of course. Um, next question, and this is... Basically, my last question for fish is like when you, you walk into a local fish store, you're looking at a fish, you really want them. What are you looking for as far as disease? Um, the biggest thing is uh, how the fish is swimming around. It's very It kind of gives you an idea of not only of its personality, but you'll be able to tell how active it is. You're not going to get a fish that's laying on a side, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking at how it swims. Uh, if its stomach is puffy or like sunk sunken in, usually means like a parasite or it's not being fed well. It could be various things. Um a lot of fish don't eat during transporting, so it could be just days without food. Um, looking at their lips to see how uh, if they're puffy or swollen, um, obviously ick, uh, fin rot, uh, beaten up by anybody else. Usually fish will target another fish that's unhealthy. So if you if you have a fish that's got nipped fins, uh, you know if it's in a 
tank full of damsels, that's to be expected. But, uh, you know, if you have a bunch of tangs in there and then one of them just has a bunch of nip fins, most likely that tang is not doing well in the first place. So I would so stay away So basically it's that. common sense. Just make sure it looks healthy, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that sums it up pretty much. All right. So, I mean, without going crazy, I've yeah, kind of answered all the questions I had for the, uh, the fish section. Mm -hmm. um, on to the cleanup crew. I don't have a ton of time left, um, but I still have cleanup crew questions. This is one thing that's highly debated online. How big should your cleanup crew be? Um, well, this is the problem that I've had is I went the recommended and did like the packs online. And the yeah, crew, and the, it's like the crew like starved a, to death. A thousand of them yeah. for like a 50 gallon tank. Like, well, I think it's more people want to make money on it. You don't really need I that much. So. I haven't, I put the cleanup crew in nine months ago and haven't added a single item except for a starfish here and there. Um, yeah. And I've lose, I'm losing cleanup crew, you know, consistently because, you know, things die. But, yeah. uh, it's going to depend on what you, what kind of algae you have, what kind of nutrient problems you have. If you're having, if you have to battle algae, uh, you might need the extra cleanup crew. But be aware, once you solve the algae problem, you need, they need to have a food source. Um, so I would not oversize your crew. I would start off small, see how they are, and then adapt as you go. Adding some, you know, rule of thumb, you can add some every three months. Just add a couple snails, a couple crabs, or something every three months, and that keeps everything stable. So. Um, on to the next question, you kind of answered it just now. Um, when buying a cleanup crew, do you strictly like hermits? Do you like snails? Do you go with both? Uh, I do a multi-prong approach when it comes to cleanup crew. Uh, you're going to want something that scavenges like a, like a hermit crab. So, you know, getting blue legs that are cheaper. Um, just be aware of blue legs. You know, hermit crabs are uh, notorious for killing your snails. So be aware of that. Um, so, and I just change up my snails. I'm really big on turbo snails. I just really like how they are. Um, so I, I do a little bit of everything. I have what three or four different starfish in my main display plus i have some in the sun plus you know shrimp and all that stuff so uh not nothing it's a multi-prong approach is what you need to look at get a little bit of everything so so with that um hermit crabs i don't have i had like two or three snails in my tank they're all three gone um and what it's from is i come into my tank check it out in the morning as everybody does and they're flipped over Mm -hmm. I flip them back over three days later. They haven't moved. They're dead. Um, so I did buy some Nasaria snails um, because they can flip themselves over. I put I put in a couple snails that I know go under the sand. I haven't seen them, so I don't yeah. know if they're Well, I don't know. Did we did we decide if you had a magnesium issue or not? Um, I don't remember because if your magnesium is elevated up to around 1500 or higher, uh, snails become, snails become lethargic in which they're not able to stick to the glass. Um, and they, they're not able to feed themselves. Um, and they're not really moving very well. So, uh, they end up dying as a result. So, um, if you guys have snails that are not moving, you need to double check your, uh, magnesium level. And get that's good range. because that's probably exactly what it is. As you know, I have, I have mm -hmm. elevated calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, mm -hmm. I don't dose salt. anything. Yeah. It's from my salt. I've been doing new water changes with new salt. I still haven't been able to get it down. Um, so you're right, though, because I've actually witnessed them sticking to the side and then falling off. Mm -hmm. So that, that it could be very well why. Mm -hmm. I don't see them anymore. They're probably yeah, just they're, stuck. Somewhere. Well, they're most likely dead because they weren't able to feed or defend yeah. themselves from the hermit crabs. So so. You, yeah, that's, that's probably exactly right. Um, and here's another thing that I've thought, like, you know, I'm kind of fighting this uh, cyano thing. Do emperor crabs eat cyano? Um, Is that more of a green hair algae thing? It, man, it's so it's so crazy. It's like having it's like throwing a peppermint shrimp in there and hoping it eats aptasia. Yeah. Uh, you can you know you could pick crabs in general to attack uh, the cyano, but. Uh, the best method for cyano is removing it manually and uh, finding the nutrient problem and fixing it, which we discussed in a previous which video. Which we know what it is. Yep. Um, so you can go ahead and do it, but I wouldn't be spending any extra money on a, on a crab hoping it would eat uh, and, fresh and slime And with the emperor crab, they could potentially start trashing my zoas, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, I've even had uh, blue leg hermit crabs uh, start picking at zoas. So, it, I, man, it's so hard to say. I mean... It's just like uh, you know buying the fish that is uh, known to eat coral, but doesn't mean it's going to eat coral. Not doesn't mean every angel is going to eat coral. It's mm -hmm. personalities, man. I've had rogue uh, uh, emerald crabs that go around and start picking off polyps and start picking at my SPS and just. Or being like an your asshole. eel, which is yeah. known to eat fish, but yours is like it's you say, cool. a model citizen. Yeah. So it. <laughs> Yeah, so basically you could try, but I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't go out and spend a whole bunch of extra money on something hoping it would eat it. You just, you know, do a little bit and see, but, it, you know, it can. Um, 
I know you have sea stars. What, what, I want something that's going to stir up my sand. I'd like a sea star. I don't want anything big is what do you suggest for like my 75 that's going to stir up the sand and potentially clean the glass or something? Uh, the chocolate chip sea star. Uh, yeah. But the problem is it's not always reef safe. It is and then it isn't. Uh, there's some debate on that. I've never personally had one because I heard that they were not reef safe. Um, but I do know what three or four people who have them in a reef tank and have no problems. So <laughs> just be aware of that. Um, and uh, something like a serpent star would be fine. They're totally fine. A brittle star, uh, you know, they're all going to mix up the sand a little bit. Uh, that link SC star uh, is pretty cool. You give it the sand. Um, but just be aware, you know, reef, you know, reef safe with caution, all that stuff. Just monitor it and make sure it's, you know, doing what it's supposed to do. All right. Well, that sums it up. That, that checked off every question on my list. I Sweet. appreciate you spending the time again. It's been fun. All right. Um, and, uh, any, any, any thoughts to sum it up? No, I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, if anybody else has any extra questions, you can just put it in the comment section below. I'm trying to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, it seems like the you know more subscribers I get, which is cool, uh, just the more questions that come in, which then takes me a little bit longer to answer them. But I do answer everybody's. Uh, I'm You're gaining on 1,000, bro. Quickly. Getting there. Uh, yeah, so i got to get that together as well. So yeah. I appreciate everyone watching and, and sticking around. And uh, as always, uh, I'll put Mike's link in the uh, description below so you can check out his channel. And uh, as always, guys, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks. Peace.